Okay. So atoms are actually themselves, they're made up of things too, but they're not the stable units. They don't exist on their own. Atoms are made up of subatomic particles, which are known as protons, neutrons, and electrons, and we'll get into all that, how they're arranged inside the atom. And even those are built of other, even smaller things. And that's what, like, in the Large Hadron Collider and Stanford, and they keep colliding things together to try to break atoms and subatomic particles up into more subatomic particles. Is it, are there chance, like, they can create, like, a black hole in that one thing? Yeah, yeah, but it's so small, I don't think it matters. Yeah, okay. Hopefully not. Yeah. Actually, my nephew does that kind of, is going to be doing that kind of theoretical research. So he'll be doing, yeah, he's going to grad school next year at uh, Chicago or something. Theoretical physics. I don't understand. I don't understand half of what he says. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so atoms can combine together using what are called chemical bonds. Okay. So they are bonded together to make what we call molecules. Okay, so two or more types of atoms. So atoms are the basic building blocks, right? You get atoms, you get them together, and you can more form molecules, okay? So that's just one way that we classify matter. But ultimately, it's all made up of atoms. Okay, just going to skip over a few slides. Because it has some of the text of what I'm saying. It, it talks about it in these slides, but I don't need to show you all the slides. I just want to make sure you have them, okay? So this is a cool picture, okay? There's a thing called a scanning tunneling microscope. And it is a very simple device. All it is is a mechanical lever that's got a really fine point on it, and they shine a laser off the back of it. Okay, so let me try to draw it. This is literally what it looks like, the very tip of the, the microscope. That's the tip, and then it has this really fine point on it like this. The way you make the fine point, or, or it could be a straight point. It doesn't have to be like on a lever, like it could be a straight point. The way you make it is you just literally cut a piece of wire. And when you cut a piece of wire, one part of the wire is going to be one atom wide somewhere at the very end. You don't think about that, but it'll be one atom wide. And then what they do is they, sh the, they can shine a light on this, and the light reflects off. And the way that this light moves as it reflects off is an indication of this little lever moving up and down. And then as they go over a surface, go left to right, they can see the lever move up and down by looking at what the laser's doing. And then they can recreate the image of what they're seeing. So this is that kind of image. This is uh, the surface, I think if it's actually silicon, uh, of silicon, and each one of these bumps is an individual atom, okay? When you get to that kind of dimension, these are really tiny. They're fractions of nanometers, okay? We're in the, we call the angstrom range, but they're really, really tiny. Uh, when you get, things look funny. They change how they look based on how hard you push on the surface or how close you get to the surface, how it looks changes, okay? You can imagine, like, if I took a picture of you by feeling your face, Right? I might touch really lightly and get one image of you, but then if I start doing this, <laughs> I might think, oh, yeah, they're kind of squishy in there. Got some real hard bones in here somewhere. So you get different images based on how you look at it. But, yeah, we can actually been able to do this uh, for about 20 years now, 30 years. This is actually a cool one. This is a more recent one. This is a strand of DNA that they, they took images of. And this, see this here? This going like this. That's a double helix. And they can actually tell, like, which DNA residues they're looking at by just scan. So if you want to know the sequence of the DNA, you can just scan over it and see it. It's weird. Anyways, that's cool stuff. But that's what matter is made of. It's made up of atoms. And all it is is these are the atoms that we have. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit about this periodic table. Um, this is the periodic table of elements. This is a cool periodic table because it tells you some interesting things, okay? The primary interesting things that it tells you are 
Red, in its elemental form, are gases. Blacks are solids at room temperature. Room temperature is about 25 degrees Celsius. What's blue? Liquid, like you think of the ocean and the water is blue, right? So they use blue. So bromine and mercury are both liquids at room temperature. And then you see all these funny ones? They're hollow, right? These are all man-made. Yeah. So uranium, this is uranium. And we're gonna, I'm going to make you memorize large sections of this, the names and the symbols, not all the numbers. So what's calcium? Right? Well, it's CN. What's magnesium? It's Mg. Okay. Some of them make a lot of sense. It's not hard. Um, you can do the first 40. It's real easy. Because most of them sound like the names, and a lot of them you've heard, because you've taken vitamins and minerals and supplements and all that. There are bunches of them are the same. Okay. So might as well put it in context of what we're seeing here. But anyways, these are all man-made. The first uh, man-made elements uh, were really like Neptunium, Plutonium, technetium, okay. The red numbers, the average weight, like we took a whole bunch of atoms and weighed them, that's how much they weighed, the average weight. We'll talk more about that in detail. Plutonium, this one, a lot of these were done at Berkeley, California. So this is Berkelium in Californium, at, or Fermium Laboratory, Fermium, right? But a guy named Seaborgium, Seaborg, discovered a lot of these. He made them in his laboratorium. I don't know. Anyways, um, as a joke, he made, when they did made plutonium, he thought, oh, I'll make it PU, Because <laughs> right? in, in other countries, they won't get it. So he just put it in. He says, no, they won't accept that because somebody will figure it out. And they took it. So that's why we got PU for plutonium. Isn't that one named after Einstein? Oh, yeah. Uh, Einsteinium, Fermium, Mendelevium, Nobelium, Laurentium. What are they used for, like Einsteinium? Um, mostly for proving things. Okay. Yeah. So we want to understand how the universe is made. So what we do is we make our own elements and see what happens to them. I guess that's the simple way to put it. Some of them, though, like technetium, this is a lot of radioactive imaging studies are used technetium. There's also a radioactive iodine that they can create that they use for treating thyroid, yeah. right? So there's a lot of the technetium. If, if you've ever heard of a PET scan, PET scan, technetium is the, is the radioactive isotope. They make that for that experiment. So you'll notice they've got a bunch of them that are solid. Those are all naturally occurring. Then the hollow ones are all man-made. There's just this one oddball in the middle of the periodic table. But it's very useful for diagnostic work. It's not very toxic, but it's easy to make. It has a very short half-life. So that what that means is you can give it to somebody, and in a very short period of time, it's all gone. Yeah. It's good stuff. I had a friend who had to have that done. And he's like, oh, check this out. And he went and grabbed the Geiger counter, because we're nerdy scientists. He goes, <laughs> I'm like, uh, thanks for coming to work. Don't kiss me. Nice guy and everything, but, you know, I just like, I'm not into radioactive people. That, that's another Half-Life reference, actually, I suppose. The game, sorry. Half-Life, yeah. Or Fallout. A lot of radioactive game-based things. Okay, sorry. So we're going to talk about this slide for quite some time. I'm going to be writing notes on it. We also have things we call the states of matter. So these represent, these little dots, okay, represent water molecules. Now, you guys know water's formula is what? H2O. H2O, right? So let me write that down here real quick, some notes here. This is H2O. In addition to identifying elements and compounds, okay, we also talk about things in terms of their state. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about states of matter. We have three physical, we call the physical states of matter. There are actually like five or six states of matter that they consider now. But the physical states of matter are what you see on this slide. 
that's an ice cube, right? That's liquid water, and that one is gas, okay? Now, the truth is, gas, when the water is a gas, you don't see it. They only did this because it looks good. This is actually the water gas. It's condensed out of the air, so it creates a lot of little water droplets. That's what you're seeing. It's the same as fog. Fog is just a bunch of little water droplets that you're seeing. It's called a colloid, and we'll get to that in chapter something, 15, 16. It's not a vapor, not in the sense of, not, well, I don't, I don't have a good definition for vapor, so okay. I'm not going to say one way or the other, really. So, so, but you think of that as a kind of a vapor. That's, but it's, this is not a gas. The gas is the stuff you don't see. So here's the thing. In a solid, the way we think about it, all the water molecules are really nicely ordered in this regular structure. Right? It's called a crystal structure, a crystalline solid. It's a very well-organized repeating pattern. How much space is between those? Not a lot, right? So when you think the solid state, these are close together. Yeah. And because they're close together, you have more matter in a given volume, so the density is going to be high. Yeah, I was going to get to that. Now, that's a generalization. It turns out water is the only one where the actual solid is usually less dense than liquid at 4 degrees Celsius. But in general, when we think about solid liquids and gas, Right? We usually think close together, more dense. Okay? Now, water as a liquid, right? the molecules, they don't show it really well here. They're, they're also very close together. In fact, they're a little bit closer together when they're in the liquid state. That's why liquid water is more dense than um, solid water, which is ice. Because when you like, get a drink, you take an ice cube and you stick it on top, it stays on the top. Unless you drink something like, I probably shouldn't talk about alcohol too much. How many of you are underage? Okay, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> so you can ignore this statement. But if you drink like scotch on the rocks, where does the ice cube go? It goes to the bottom of the glass. Because alcohol's density is only like 0.7. So the ice cube goes to the bottom. The reality is that back in the good old days, scotch on the rocks was literally scotch on rocks that had been pulled out of the river. Because they didn't have ice back in those sure. days, right? So that's where we got scotch on the rocks. All right, so, so we think about solid state, close together, nice organized, liquid state, close together, but not so organized. And the thing about the, in the liquid state, these guys can move around each other. They're not locked into place. So they're fluid is the way we think about it. In, in the gas state, okay, what do we know about the gas state? Well, there's a lot more room between the molecules. This is kind of an exaggeration of the size of the molecules. The distance between the molecules is actually much more than that in the gas state. They're really far apart. Most of it is just empty space in the gas state. The molecules have a lot of energy, so they're moving faster. So we say low density, high energy, relative to the solid state. And we consider that the energy is this motion, kinetic energy, motion energy, right? These are in the solid state, let me finish, I didn't really finish, close together, high density, and usually, like in water, uh, in the solid state, it's uh, rigid. That is, doesn't move around. Once the molecule is placed into the solid, it doesn't move around, or the atom is placed in the solid, it doesn't move around the structure at all, it stays in place, okay? All right, so I'm gonna write a little side note here. Because I like doing stuff like this. All right, solid, liquid, and gas of one type of substance, okay? Which is highest in energy? Gas is at highest, right? So I'm going to put gas up here. And which is the lowest in energy then? Solid. 
because they're not moving around and they're stuck together. So we put the solid state in here. And then in between those would be the liquid state because, you know, it's like Goldilocks and the three bears in the middle. So let's say you have a solid and you want to make it into a liquid. That means you're going to go like that, right? We call that, what do we call it when we go solid to liquid? Common term. Change of smell. Melting. melting, yeah. <laughs> call it melting, right? I'm melting. So what you're going to do when you go outside after class today. And there's actually a scientific term for it. It's called fusion, but we're not going to go into there. Not yet. We will later. This is freezing. But think about this, okay, because I put them in, in terms of energy. The solid state's lower in energy than the liquid state, so in order to go to the liquid state, you have to put energy into it in order to boost the molecules up to have enough energy. Solid state's low energy. Liquid state's high energy. To get there, you have to give it energy. So like when an ice cube melts, where's the energy coming from? the liquid in the cup or the air around it, right? There's a lot of energy outside the ice cube that goes into it to melt it, and as a result, everything else around the ice cube gets cold, All right? So this is a process where energy has to go in on this side. To go from solid to liquid, you gotta put energy into that side. On the other hand, if you want to go the other way, if you have a liquid, you want to go to solid. In, the, in other words, you want to make ice cubes, right? What do you have to do then? Yeah. You have to freeze it, you have to, and you have to pull the energy out. If you have to put energy in for it to go to the liquid state, you've got to pull energy out to go to the solid state. There's a basic principle in this called conservation of energy, that the amount of energy you pull out, right, has to equal the amount of energy to, to go from the solid to the liquid state. You know that some energy has to come out. Okay, so if you're going to put so much energy in to go from the solid to the liquid, you're going to have to take the same amount of energy out to go from the liquid back to the solid. So how many of you remember when you were little kids, or maybe this week, who knows, I don't know who you are, when you got your shoes wet and you stuck them underneath your refrigerator? You guys remember that? You ever do that? You just stick them in the dryer now? I've never done that. You've never done that? Oh my God, you guys are deprived. Okay, get your feet wet. You don't, have to do your, you don't have to use your shoes because it it's, can smell really bad. But you just stick them in front of the vent in front of your refrigerator because what comes out of the vent in the front of your refrigerator usually is warm air. The warm air is coming because you're trying to freeze stuff in your freezer or keep it cold on the inside, so you've got to pull all that heat out. So this energy that's coming out is what you're getting right, when you use your freezer or your refrigerator. Okay, so if, if by same token, liquid to gas, that's called uh, vaporization. Which way does energy have to go? It's got to go in, right? You got to put energy in to make it go up. So I don't need to draw two E's. I could just use the same E and draw an arrow like that. And when you go the other way, what do we call it when goes, gas goes to liquid? Condensation, Condensation yeah. It's what you see when you take a shower. That hot steam that comes out of the shower, it hits the cold windows of your house, right? And then you look at the windows and what do you see? You see a bunch of liquid there. Where'd the liquid come from? It came from the gas that was created by the hot water that when you took a shower, hits the cold window, condenses out, and that's where the liquid comes from. All right? Or if you take a soda cup, I'll draw this one here or a cup, and you put ice in it. Well, maybe I'll just make them into cubes just for fun. I don't know what this is, some weird cube. All right, that's my Escher cube. They're all good except for that one. All right, what do you see on the outside of this? See, you see liquid out here, right? Little droplets all over it. Where does that liquid come from? 
Yeah, don't, don't, don't say it yet. Where does the liquid, think about it. Where does the liquid come from? Half the time when I do this, I talk about it just in general, especially when you talk to little kids, but in general, about half the time that I do it, people say, well, it comes from the liquid in the cup. Yeah. No, it comes from the air. That's right. right? They're like, well, how's the liquid getting through the cup then? Then they're like, I don't know. It comes, it comes from the air around. There's a lot of moisture in the air. Like, I can feel it today. It's kind of humid today. All right. Okay, so let's move on. That's what humidity is, huh? Yeah, humidity is just water in the air. And you feel that, oh, it's really humid. That's just the water in there. When I was in North Carolina, it was so humid, you'd take a shower, leave your refrigerated air-conditioned room, and you walk outside. In two seconds, you're covered with water, liquid, all over your body. I was in Georgia, I didn't see it. Yeah. yeah. Could, you, could you uh, say that definition for the conservation of energy one more time? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so go like this. Conservation. Oh, let me do it on the slide, actually. I'm going to do it like this. This is a this is an application of the conservation of energy. Okay. I will give you the official definition. I'll tell you how I applied it here. Conservation of energy. Energy can't be destroyed or created in a chemical physical process. this too right after so if you don't like get it all that's I like to babble on really fast sometimes okay so this is how I said it I said hey if it takes a certain amount of energy to go from the solid to liquid that is you're putting energy in it takes exactly the same amount of energy to go from liquid to solid and that's the concept is you're not going to get more energy in or more energy out by going from solid to liquid it's the exact same amount either going in or the exact same amount coming Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that does depend on how much water you have or how much ice you have. More ice is going to take more energy. Less ice takes less energy. Oh yeah, but super frozen, right? Because so that means the ice actually is lower. So you actually have to warm it up to go from a low temperature to its when it starts to melt. So that's going to require energy, too. But if you want to take it back to that super frozen, really cold state, then you have to take extra energy out just to get back to that low temperature. But it's always going to be, this, in theory, always going to be the same amount of energy. Now, in practice, it never is. But we'll talk. maybe we'll have time to talk about that in the distant future. Okay. Let me use a little side notes here. There's two kinds of solids. We call them crystalline solids or amorphous solids. So don't read the definition, just look at the pictures. What do you notice about crystalline solid versus amorphous solid? Yeah, crystalline solids are very organized. The way we say it, right? Arranged in patterns that repeat. The long range thing's kind of important, but as long as you remember arranged in patterns that repeat, then, you know, if it keeps repeating, that's long range, right? And amorphous solids don't have a, any long-range order. Now, I can tell you that most amorphous solids are like plastic. And when you take plastic, you see how it flexes like that and it's soft? Or wax. Wax is soft and you can squish it and make things out of it. That's because... right. It doesn't have a regular pattern, so when you squish an amorphous solid, the atoms and molecules just kind of squish along with it. Okay, crystalline solids are like uh, kind of like glass, but more like rocks. Rocks have a lot of crystalline solids and have regular crystallized shapes. 
You see this regular shape, right, on the atomic scale, and then when, it, when you look at the large scale, when you're actually looking at the rock, it maintains this shape. You see this regular pattern in the rock. Now, if I took a, a piece of jello, which is kind of a, well, jello is a bad example, a wax, and hit you on the head with it, what would the wax do? It would change its shape, right? You'd be like, why'd you hit me on the head with this wax? If I took a rock and hit you on the head with it, what would happen? Your head would change its shape, right? Because it, the crystalline solids turn out to be really hard because they have this very well-organized uh, structure that makes them very rigid, okay? Now, not all crystalline solids are that way. Some of them are soft, okay? But generally speaking... When it's soft and flexible or moldable, that's usually amorphous solids. It's the way we look at them, waxes, plastics, things like that. Are all amorphous uh, solids like moldable? Uh, I won't say that because I don't know all amorphous solids, but very much the common ones you see. Any plastic containers, any um, like springy floor material, rubber, those are all amorphous solids. They have interesting properties, too, because crystalline solids, they will maintain their shape until you hit a certain temperature, and then they'll completely liquefy. And that's what we call the melting point. At a specific temperature, they start to melt. It turns out amorphous solids just get softer and softer and softer. Yeah. That's why, like the guy who makes the unicorns at the fair with the glass, glass is actually amorphous solid. So you can heat it up and it gets soft and doesn't like completely turn into a puddle when you heat it up. If it turned into a puddle completely, then the glass guy would be sitting there trying to make a unicorn and we just have this big puddle of glass underneath. It would be probably not as interesting, right? All right. Let me skip over some of this. A couple other things about gases and how they're different than solids and liquids is that they have a lot of space between the molecules, and so you can compress them together. So gases are compressible. Let's highlight it down here. And that's just because of all the space or the very low density that gases have, all the space between the molecules. So what do they put in shock absorbers? Gas, like in your car. If they put liquid in your shock absorbers, it would be really bad, because every bump you hit would just drive that thing up into your car, and you would be bouncing around all the time. What do they put in the soles of your shoe? They always talk about, right? They, they put, what's that? Nike Air. Nike Air, right? They put air pockets in there, because it's compressible, and it squishes around under your feet. So gases, because of their compressibility, have a lot of cool applications. Another interesting thing about a gas is it always assumes the shape and volume of its container. So, for example, if I took a small amount of perfume and let it go in the corner over here, right, initially she would smell it, and then you would smell it, and then they'd smell it in the middle, but eventually the whole room would be filled with this smell, right? Because the gas, the perfume is made up of gas molecules, occupies the entire space of the room. Now, if you put a liquid in the room, what does the liquid do? It just sits in that spot, okay? Unless it evaporates and turns into a gas, and then it moves out and fills the whole room up. So gases will fill, always fill the volume of their container. Whereas liquids conform to their container, and solids have their own shape. Okay? So just a little... Summary chart, this is a good thing to know well. Okay. Gases free to move relative to one, each other, uh, one another. They're really far apart, that gives us the density. The shape, we say it's indefinite, and its compressibility is compressible. Right. In terms of energy, gas of a type of material is always the highest energy state, that's not on this chart. Solids, right? The, the atoms or molecules are fixed in place. They don't get to move around each other. Right? They're very close together. The shape is definite. That means it has its own shape. And it's incompressible. Why is a solid incompressible? 
because there's no very little space between the atoms. Nowhere to go, nowhere to squeeze it in together. Liquids are very much like solids, except for the atoms have enough energy they can move around each other. So they're still close together, but the shape is indefinite, which means if you put it into a container, it conforms to its container, whatever container you put it in. The volume is definite, and it's also incompressible, right? So if you jump off the high dive in a belly flop competition, you attain the perfect horizontal posture, what happens when you hit the water? It hurts, <laughs> right? That smack is because the water is not compressible. If you did that to a giant airbag, what would happen? You would hit the airbag, it would compress, and you wouldn't get all that you know, red on your face and all that good stuff. So, All right. Now, this is one of those subjects that most chemists hate talking about, but I'm going to make you do it because I'm supposed to. Okay, so this is supposed to be good for you. I don't know. Mixtures, right, and pure substances. If it's a pure substance, it's only made of one type of atom or molecule. So like H2O, pure substance. Because it's water, like liquid water you drink, it's a pure substance. We're in Fresno. Just forget that part. Okay. But when you get good water, it's just water, probably very few of you have tasted really pure water. It tastes really, really good. Okay. But really pure water is just, it's a pure substance. You could also get pure oxygen in the tank, which is not good for you. Okay. You need a little bit of oxygen. You need 20% or so. Um, but that would also be a pure substance. It's just made up of oxygen atoms. So pure substances, one kind of atom or molecule. And then we have mixtures. Now, there's different kinds of mixtures. Now, ignoring the bubbles, this is mostly water. It's soda. I don't know if you guys know this. Like 95%, 99% water. This is diet, so there's literally no sugar in it, right? So sugar makes up a lot of regular soda. This kind of mixture is known as a homogeneous mixture. Because I can drink this, and all the way from top to bottom, except for the fizz, just ignore that part. It tastes the same all the time. The composition is always the same all the way throughout. So we talk about mixtures as being okay, two or more kinds of molecules together. There's the flavorant molecules, there's the water, there's the color, the caramel, all that stuff. But they're all mixed together evenly, right? That's a mixture. That's one type of mixture. Okay. Let's see, what do I want to say? Oh, yeah. The other thing about mixtures is that the composition can vary. So if you go to one state or another state, you'll find out that sometimes the soda tastes a little bit different. That's because even though it's a mixture and we call it soda, it's slightly different from state to state to state. Tailor the flavor to the local community kind of thing. Like how hot food tastes better than cold food. Um, I would argue that, but okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so. So this is how we break it down. Yeah, charts. This is how we break it down. There are pure substances, and we already said that they're elements or compounds. Elements are just made up of one kind of atom. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean one atom, just one kind of atom. Okay? And so there can be elements like oxygen... We'll talk more about this when we do compounds. Like oxygen, the element oxygen is O. It's right here on the periodic table. It's next to N. What's N? Nitrogen. nitrogen. And what's F? Fluorine. Fluorine. That one maybe you don't know. But nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine there, right? Oxygen, though, the element is O, but when you find it in nature, it's O2. That's still an element because it's just one kind of atom. Okay. Compounds, on the other hand, are two or more kinds of atoms together, but they're always in the same proportions to each other. That's why we can find, for chemical formulas, we can write things like C6H12O6. That's what we typically use for glucose. That's not glucose, by the way. That's sucrose, but that's table sugar. 
But compounds are always in some definite proportion to the elements are always in some definite proportion to each other. And typically, we think about them as, as molecules. Okay? We'll elaborate on that later. So matter com is, is composed of pure substances and mixtures. To make a mixture, you just take two or more pure substances and you put them together. And that's a mixture. Okay. So homogeneous and heterogeneous. This is oil on water. Okay, so it's not really heterogeneous, is it? Because they're separated. I was thinking about that last night. Oh yeah, this is. You see but what but I'm is a bad no, thing. let's not get too. I understand what you're saying. This part's homogeneous. This part's homogeneous. That's right. But if you try to mix these together, you it's heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. You're heterogeneous. Yeah. This is homogeneous because it's kind of the same all the way throughout. The thing about the difference between a compound, though, because it's two or more elements combined together, constant proportion, okay, is that you can vary the proportions in mixtures. Okay. So, like, if I have, if I put, sh uh, if I want to make sweet tea, you know what sweet tea is? It's tea with sugar in it, right? <laughs> Sorry. In the South, they say, "Would you like that sweet or unsweet?" They don't even yeah, they used to. They'd be unsweet. What's unsweet? It took me a long time to figure out, oh, just tea. <laughs> but you can change the amount of sugar you put in there. But it makes a homogeneous mixture to a point, right? So you can have a homogeneous mixture, but you can have variable composition because you can change the proportions of each thing. Heterogeneous mixture, actually my favorite heterogeneous mixture example is I make chili verde with beans. That's definitely a heterogeneous mixture. And then I mix and I put it on rice, right? Definitely heterogeneous mixture. Because there are different amounts of beans all over that pot and different amounts of rice and different amounts of pork or whatever I decide to make it out of, okay? And I'm happy to share recipes, by the way. I got a new one. I got a green chili sauce that I made. It's really good. It makes good chili verde. It's not actually made out of chilies. It's made out of... What do you make it out of? You may know? Tomatillos, yeah. I didn't know that. Somebody told me, oh, I make it with tomatillos. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I've been making it nonstop for about three or four weeks. Just working on the recipe. Small batches, you know. And then you make salsa from it. You make lots of stuff from it. It's good with fish. It's like, it's like no, 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 no. Sorry. I know I sound so stupid up here, but it's like the best thing ever. Um, so something about an element, since it's one type of substance, one type of atom, okay, it can't be broken down into simpler substances. Okay, so that's just one of the part of the definition. But I just usually say it's one kind of atom. The test of whether or not it's one kind of atom is whether or not you can try to make it simpler by breaking it up, and you can't. Okay? That was the test they would apply all the time at the 16, 1700s. Take something, heat it, electrify it, add things to it, and see what came out of it. If nothing else came out of it, they just would come to the conclusion, like, this must be the simplest substance that we can get out of it, and that was an element. Okay. And like all the known elements are on the periodic table, that periodic table is clearly not complete because we have all the names from 110 to 118 now. And so there's even four. You see that 110, 111, 112, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. They've got all of these now. They've been very busy the last 10 years. And they've actually given them all names. So you're like, well, uh, yeah, U U U is one one one. This is the this is the abbreviation of the of the Latin for the number. Yeah, they just give them a number. There's only one right now that's named after, or actually, there's two now named after people that are alive that were alive at the time. Seaborgium was one of them. He's a very cool guy. I met him. Very cool, nice. And then the other one's just recently, one of the last four. Very cool. Anyways, well, if you're a chemist. I'll read you some chemistry stories later. Uh, compounds, 
just to restate what I said, okay, pure substances composed of two or more elements, so like H2O, C6, H12O6, right? CH3OH. You see here the different element symbols that I'm saying in there? That's a compound. If it's an element, it's just O, or it's N, or it's F, or it's something like that. Or F2, or O2, or S8 is one of the weird ones. And compounds, you can, this was the test, you could take and break it up into simpler substances. So like if you took water, you could put an electric current through it and you can get hydrogen and oxygen. And maybe I'll bring it. We have a giant hydrogen oxygen generator at the college. You hook it up to a car battery. You can make liters and liters of basically explosive gas. But yeah. Yeah, you could take water and convert it into hydrogen and oxygen. That's how we generate, a lot of times how we generate Fuel for fuel cells is to generate hydrogen by what we call electrolysis. And we use solar panels to generate the electricity. The electricity converts the water into hydrogen fuel and oxygen. Okay. Okay, this just really quickly. Now, and then we're going to do some... Uh, Homogeneous mixture, I'll go through this. I already said the examples. I'll fill this out for you. Mixtures can be classified by how, by how uniform they mix. So homogeneous, same composition throughout. So my example today was sweet tea. And the composition can be varied by changing the amount of sugar that goes in there. Okay. For compounds, it can't be varied. It's always the same ratios, H2 to O, right? Two hydrogens for every oxygen. Heterogeneous mixtures, right? Composition that's non-uniform. My example for today was chili verde because that's what I'm thinking about. I have a big bag of it in the freezer right now. Actually, in the fridge. But you know what I screwed up? I didn't cook the beans right. It's like... It's really heterogeneous. So some of them are hard and some of them are soft. I was lazy. I don't have a pressure cooker. I have children that would blow that thing up. I know because I was one of them. Okay. I got a little bit more before I can take a break here. So let's uh, do this stuff. Okay, so, so let's try this. Let's classify these as... Okay. Mixture, hang on, don't yell it out loud. Mixture, and then if it's a mixture, homogeneous or heterogeneous, or a pure substance, an element, or a compound. So first, uh, mercury in a thermometer. So the actual mercury in the thermometer, what is mercury? Oh. It's an element, right? So that automatically makes it a pure substance. So this is pure. And it's an element. Exhaled air. Oh, nasty. It's a mixture. Now, like if I go, <sighs> I didn't do it at you. <sighs> like that, right? What do you, you don't see it, right? But the assumption is it smells bad all the way through. I mean, you guys don't know, right? Do you know? I don't know. People up front know. They're just being nice. What is that? Is that homogeneous or heterogeneous? Homogeneous. Homogeneous, because it's the same smelly mixture all the way through. So this is a mixture, right? And it's homogeneous. Chicken noodle soup. Heterogeneous, heterogeneous mixture, right? And what about sugar? It's a compound. Say pure substances, right? So that's a pure substance. So it's pure substance and it's a compound. Right? You want a lot of these on the test, right? They're not hard to do. I'll try to stay away from the weird ones. Like sometimes people don't know, like motor oil. It depends on if it's used or if it's new. And even when it's new, there's additives in it. So it's actually a homogeneous mixture. Right? Okay. Well, because otherwise it would be a compound. Yeah, because the, if you had the oil pure enough, it would just be a compound. It turns out oils, the way they, it's a hydrocarbon, it's a mixture of hydrocarbons. So you don't, 
it's hard to know, like, well, how do I classify it? That's kind of why I hate this subject, because there's so many things that you want to try to classify, but if you don't know enough information, you can't. So I'll stick to the stuff um, that's obvious, I guess. So let me skip through a few of these. Okay. So we talked about another thing that we can do is that we can look at physical properties, chemical properties, and then I want to talk about one other thing with this, even though I have separate slides for it. Physical changes and chemical changes, okay? So let me talk about what a physical change is before I talk about this. Physical change is liquid to gas, right? Solid to liquid. It's a change in the state or the appearance. So I'm make that a little note here. So a physical change is a change in appearance, but not composition. Um, it depends on if it's change in composition that causes that. But liquid crystal displays, for example, L, uh, LCDs, they change color, right? It turns out the molecules in there are not changing. It's a physical change. It's what they're doing is they're stretching and unstretching and that absorbs different wavelengths of light. So, like, physically, the atoms are just... They're changing how they're moving. How they're moving or associated, change, yeah. Changes the atoms themselves. Yeah, so the chemical change, the difference between a physical change and a chemical change is a chemical change changes the composition. The rearrangement. rearrangement of atoms yeah. in molecules, usually. Yeah. So a chemical change is a change in composition. So I just said, chemical change equals changed composition. And I said it and it's recorded, so hopefully you got that. All right, so th let's talk about this now. Now, we can, now we're in a place where we talk a little bit better about physical properties and chemical properties. Physical and chemical properties are observed when you see physical and chemical changes. That's the simple part of it, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, when ice melts, okay? That's a physical change, right? Because I'm going from H2O solid to H2O liquid. So I could write it like this. It's still H2O. Yeah. So I can go physical change H2O liquid goes to H2O solid. It's still H2O. It's the same composition. So that's a physical change. And it turns out, if you measure the temperature during this change, it is always zero degrees Celsius. Or what is it in Fahrenheit? I don't know. Minus 32. Yeah, 32. Minus 32. 32. It's 32. Yeah, it's 32. I did the calculation in my head. I'm like, what is it in Fahrenheit? I don't know. Yes, yeah, 32 degrees. I should know. 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So at that temperature, that's the temperature at which you see this physical change occur. So the physical property Oops, my pen went haywire. is the melting point. Hardness is another physical property. How do you observe the hardness? Well, there's a bunch of different ways. You can get a special meter to measure it, or you can get a set of tools that you scratch it with. 
Well, the physical change is taking the surface of that material and then scratching it, okay? When you've determined which tool does the scratching, you've determined its hardness. The, the hardness is the physical property. The change is going from this regular crystalline pattern to this gouged pattern. But it's a change in appearance. It's still the rock. You haven't changed it, but you've now measured its physical property. So hardness is one of those as well. Mose. What's that? Mose. The Mohs, yeah, on Mohs. All right, so uh, back up, back up. Oh, let's see. Do I want to do this? Can I go back like that? Whoa, what happened? Okay, I can't do what I wanted to do, so I'll just undo what I did. All right. So physical properties are observed during physical changes, right? Other things that they point out that are physical changes that maybe aren't obvious, taste. Like when you taste something that's sweet, right? You have a taste bud. I don't even know exactly what it looks like. I've seen pictures of the pretty horrific looking. But anyways, the sugar molecule goes into the taste bud. It binds to that taste receptor and creates a physical change in that receptor that triggers your brain to say, hey, that's sweet. Okay? But you're not making, you don't take, when you taste something, it's still sugar molecules you're tasting before and after. It's not like you tasted it and suddenly it tastes different. It tastes the way it does and that taste stays there because it's the same molecule. So taste is an example of a physical property, right? You usually measure that when the a little more complicated, the sugar molecule binds to that receptor. That's the physical change of it. It changes its shape as it binds to the receptor. Uh, melting points, when I measured, appearance is also a physical property. Okay. Chemical properties you observe during chemical changes. That's the making of new substances. Okay? So if I took this money, which I don't know why I have so much money in my pocket, but um, I don't usually carry any cash. Not because... I couldn't, it's because I spend it or give it to people. It's really bad. So you take that $5 bill and you light it on fire. Can I spend what I burn? I'm not burning my cash the right way, right? If I light this $5 bill on fire, it becomes this pile of ashes. Yeah, right? a That's a chemical change because I made something else out of it. And you can't go back and put it And I can't necessarily easily go back and make it back into a $5 bill. See, that's kind of well, what's the, what's the chemical? If that's the chemical change, what's the chemical property? It's the flammability of the material. How flammable it is, how combustible it is, okay? Cooking, cooking is chemical changes. You take an egg and you cook it, right? You make it into something else. It's cooked forever. Yeah, it's basically cooked forever and you can't uncook it. Okay. So... Let's see. Other examples? Um, rusting. All right. It's a chemical change because you start with iron and you end up with iron oxide. Okay. It doesn't look this pretty, by the way. That's never that way, but that's fine. Um, you make a new substance out of it. You incorporate the oxygen from the air into the iron, and that's a chemical change. All right, any questions about physical chemical changes, physical chemical properties? I don't think we need to go on and on with it. I think there's a few examples, and I'm going to just do those examples. Okay. <clears throat> Which of the following is a physical or chemical property? The explosiveness of hydrogen gas. Chemical, because when hydrogen burns... It's basically the burning of hydrogen. Any combustion, any burning is a chemical change. So like I always used to say, my cooking is an example of a chemical change because I burn stuff all the time. <laughs> but, but the explosiveness of hydrogen gas is a chemical change. The bronze color of copper. Physical property, yes. How it looks, right? Shiny appearance of silver. Physical, it's appearance, right? Uh, ability of dry ice to sublime. That goes from the solid to the gas. Physical, too, because it's physical because it's still CO2 as a solid and CO2 as a gas. So what is this one? Chemical and the rest are physical. All right. 
just a couple of more slides down. Yeah, so burning, I just want to make sure we covered this, all right? Burning is a chemical change, and then from the chemical change, you, combustibility is a chemical property that you'd measure, okay? But again, like if you just take meat or vegetables and you, you do the Cajun black and, I love doing like black and uh, green beans, that's a chemical change, right? Make something good out of it. All right, so let's take a break there. Um, let's do about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and get started again. This is kind of Lavoisier's. Lavoisier, yeah. Lavoisier is con one of contrib his contributions, conservation of mass. Big on the measure and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So suppose you have 12 grams of natural gas, and it combines with 48 grams of oxygen in the flame. The chemical change produced 33 grams of carbon dioxide, how many grams of water? And how many grams of water? So let's think about conservation mass. What did I start with? Well, just tell me the things and we'll add it up. Oxygen, right? It's so 48 grams of oxygen. It's actually O2 plus uh, 12 grams of natural gas, which um, is CH4, it turns out. Methane. Methane. That's going to be conservation of mass, says that's going to be equal to 33 grams of CO2 plus something else, right? And the water. Or you could say it's X. You know, that makes people happy when you put X in an equation, because you can always solve for X. So this is going to be 60 grams is equal to 33 grams plus X. So X is 27. She said it earlier. So I pointed at her. Crazy to think this is how we came up with atomic theory, by doing a lot of measurements like this over and over and over again for lots of reactions. And a guy named John Dalton put it all together and said, oh, things must be made out of atoms. I'm like, how do you think of that? I would have been playing with Play-Doh or something. I don't know. All right. When we talk about energy, the thing we're really low on right now, right? Energy, by definition, is the capacity to do work. That is like you break the Latin down. It's the energy contained. It's the work within. Okay. Well, and then the game definition of work is the result of a force acting on a distance. That's basically the ability to move something. That's right. Okay? That's work. So kind of odd concept of work is, in, in physics at least, okay, this is, I'm moving this. I'm doing work, right? I'm doing work. I'm doing work. I'm doing work. I'm doing, because I'm force, I'm pushing it, and it's a distance. I am not doing any work because I'm not moving it anymore. It doesn't matter how hard I pull. That's push. That's not work. Isn't that weird? So it's a force acting on a distance that creates work. If it doesn't move, you didn't do work. That's how I judge what my kids do at the house. If something moved, they didn't work. The stuff's still all there. They didn't do work. They don't get to play. Okay. So, the way matter behaves is driven usually by the energy it contains and the energy that it goes to. It's an energy change that usually drives what happens. And in general, okay, this is kind of like everything as you get older. Sorry, guys, I'm going to make you depressed. Everything wants to go downhill, right? What does that mean? Well, if I take a ball... And I have a hill, and this is my hill. Oh, that's not a very good hill. It looks like a cliff. I'm not going to push the ball down the cliff. That just sounds too mean. Here's the ball. If I wait long enough, where does it end? At the bottom, right? This is high energy. 
well, hang on, and this is low energy. Now, if it doesn't move, it didn't do anything, but it has the ability to move and release energy, so we call it potential energy. Kinetic energy is when it's moving. The actual, this part where it's flying down the hill like this, this is kinetic energy, movement energy. When electrons move in a wire, you don't think about this, but you have electrons in a wire called electricity, that's kinetic energy because the electrons are moving in the wire. Okay? Now, so there's kinetic energy moving, there's potential energy it's stored, Chemical energy is a potential energy. And so you're going from one stored energy to another stored energy. And generally, it likes to go from high energy to low energy. Okay? Now, there's kind of an interesting thought. If I take a piece of paper and I light it on fire, okay? One, I'll probably get trouble in the classroom. But take a piece of paper and light it on fire. What are you going to feel? Heat. Heat, right? Because the paper... When it goes, this is conservation of energy now. Goes from a state of high energy, the paper, to a state of low energy, which is the ash. It has to get rid of that energy. Conservation of energy says if the paper, chemical energy, is going from high to low, that energy has to go somewhere. And that's what you're feeling as the heat. All right? So things tend to, in general, go downhill. Wow. Is that, if that goes along with Oh, now you're asking a whole different question. Yeah, like, but it does, it does, it does, it does. And so given that trend, I mean, can we take energy and move it back into matter? Because that's not a reversal process. Because eventually it is, is but, okay, so just like this, okay, he asked about entropy. Does this go along with entropy? And this is a, very, a much more it's sort of advanced kind of conversation, but here's a simple answer, okay. Entropy is, has to do with dispersal of energy how energy gets moved about, okay? In general, entropy likes things to be in more states, more disorder, more chaos. So if you say, I start at a high state of energy, this is the paper, and I light it and go to a low state of energy, it's released heat energy, that's the dispersal of energy part, that's created the disorder outside the universe. You can always go back. But you're going to have to take all that energy back and put a lot of energy into reorganizing it back. So it turns out it takes more energy to put it back to the way it was than it did to get it to where it went to. And as a result, this is the weird thing about entropy, you always lose more energy trying to bring it back than you got by bringing it forward. Because it's a one-way process. Eventually, we're going to run out of energy. Billions and billions and billions and billions of years from now, all the energy will have been dispersed evenly throughout the universe. We won't be here. <laughs> Nothing will be here. It'll just be done. Unless the universe collapses, and then it might just start all over again. Yeah, who knows? I don't know that answer. That's a much bigger, bigger question that we're answering here. Yeah. It's good to think about. And if you didn't understand any of that, it's okay. <laughs> it all goes downhill, just remember that. <laughs> I got another friend who ties it in to, to evolution and reproduction. Uh, he, was, uh, he made a video the other day. It wasn't a dirty video, but he talked about, you know, <laughs> evolution and reproduction and telomeres and all that kind of stuff. All right. So law of conservation of energy is like the conservation of math. Mass energy is neither created nor destroyed. Okay. So the energy you start with equals the energy you end with. Just like we did with conservation of mass, the mass that I started with equals the mass that I end with. That is conservation of mass, and conservation of energy says this, actually. It's very simple. We use Q to represent energy a lot of times, so I'm just going to write it like this. If I have all these different energy changes, like Q, I'll call it Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. I could just go on and on and on. All these energy changes, conservation of mass says that's equal to zero. Because I can't make more energy 
if en some energy is going to be lost somewhere, some is going to be gained somewhere. But that's kind of the way we write it. At least this is a kind of the Chem 1A level, and we're going to use it in this class a little bit. But if you could take all the energies and add them up, they always add up to zero. And conservation means, right, saved. You save it, made it exactly the same as it was before. Okay. It changes one way, it's got to change back to Yeah, if you're going to lose way. energy, like in the, the burning of the paper, it releases energy, right? Some energy had to be gained by somebody else. Like these people up here would have felt the heat. So the paper would have gone down in energy, but they would have all gone up in energy. And when you add it all together, it gets zero out of it. And in that equation, that you've got basically the summation is equal to a constant. Yeah. The constant is zero. That constant is zero for so conservation of energy. Yeah. 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 All right. So let's talk about um, types of energy. I mentioned some of these already. There's kinetic energy, energy associated with motion. That would be like my children. Always moving, right? Always throwing off a lot of heat. And then there's potential energy, energy associated with position or composition. Now, remember I said chemical energy is potential energy because of the way the atoms are arranged. They have the ability to rearrange. So that's what we mean by potential energy. I always relate myself to the potential energy, because my kids are always moving. I'm always sitting down somewhere telling my kids what to do. I could do it, but I would rather have my children mow the lawn at this temperature. So. And then there's electric energy, right? Electrical energy, the energy associated with the flow of electric charge, which we call electrons, OK? I'm sure you guys are mostly familiar with that. <clears throat> we talk about heat. Remember talking about heat? Like you feel, and it gets hot when I burn the paper. You feel heat, right? That's actually known as thermal energy. And really, actually, what's happened in thermal energy, and this is kind of a weird concept, is your molecules are vibrating. And as that energy gets transferred, as the molecules vibrate, right, that's heat. Energy right, associated with random motions of atoms and molecules in matter. So when I burn the paper, you pick up the radiation, the light from the paper, and that causes the molecules in your skin to vibrate, and then you sense that as heat, okay? Or temperature, sorry. That's thermal energy. And then there's chemical energy uh, down here. I already said that, All right? So we'll talk about that some more later. Ah, example of potential energy, hydroelectric, right? Uh, Edison Project, all these things that are up in the Sierras and Pine Flat Dam, Right? High potential energy, because gravity is the force. Right? And by position, the water wants to go down to here. So what do they do is they put a little pump in here. And as this thing, water comes down and out, they use that to generate electricity, because you have stored potential energy in the water. Okay? Um, let's see. I'm going to do. Use turbine. Use turbine, yeah. We'll have to talk about Edison Project one of these. That's a really cool thing. You guys know about the Edison Project? Look it up. It's really cool. It's how we store nuclear energy. In water, in lakes, we move lakes up and down to store the nuclear energy. Yeah, weird. OK, so units of energy. The, the standard units are joule and calorie. I would just say, typically, <clears throat> food is done in calories. I don't know if they've switched over to joules on everything. Let's see. Ah, let's see. Ah, 190 calories. That's what that says. So that's one of the unit. Now, I'm going to clarify this for you in a second. Right? A joule is the SI unit. We talked about SI units the other day. Calorie is the old unit that, um, who came up with calories? Either Kelvin or Watt or Joule. No, it wasn't Joule. Joule came up with Joule. Yeah. Yeah, but calorie is an interesting unit. It's the amount of energy. It doesn't say how much energy it is. The amount of energy to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So imagine I have a one gram of water. That's a, a milliliter of water. And I want to raise its temperature one degree Celsius. That is, by definition, a calorie. Okay? 
So we think of it as, oh, food calories, right? But it's actually, the, by definition, how much energy it takes to raise the temperature of water, okay? Now, the nutritional calorie, and this is where I lied. This is 190 nutritional calories. It's a capital C as opposed to a lowercase c. And that is, right, as it says down here, a nutritional calorie is a thousand of these. So this is the amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of a thousand grams of water one degree or a kilogram of water one degree Celsius. Okay. Now, it's also known as a kcal. And that's exact, that's a definition, one k count. A kilocalorie. Answer. A kilocalorie, because it's the th kilo is the prefix for thousand calories, yeah. Now, kilowatt hours, it's, it turns out if you take a kilowatt and you multiply it times hours, uh, it comes up to this kilowatt hours. That's the same as this many joules. It's not a clean conversion because hours has... 60 minutes to an hour and all that kind of stuff. So it's a little weird. Um, but it, anyways, that's a, another energy unit. Uh, like I said, it's used by PG&E. It's used by all these power companies. All right. So the complete combustion of a small wooden match produces 512 calories of heat. How many kilojoules are in there, are produced? Okay, so let's do this. I have 5, 12. I'm going to write this out, calories. I want to know kilojoules. What do I need to know? And you guys that are in the second lab, I'll go through all this stuff. If, you don't, if it's not familiar to you, I'll go with, through it with you. But I know from the previous page that one calorie is... 4.184 joules. That's kind of by definition, I think. Right? And I know that a joule and the kilojoule are related because a thousand joules equals one kilojoule. Now, I'm starting with calories. I'm going to joules, and I'm ending at kilojoules, so I have all the conversions I need, okay, to do the problem. So I have two conversion factors. Um, when I go to do this, I'm going to do this. I'm actually going to move this over a little bit because I didn't give myself enough room. There we go. Remember, I called this railroad tracks earlier. Like that. There are two conversion factors, so I put in two boxes. And then I set out and cancel units by saying calorie goes to the bottom and joules goes to the top. And the 4.184 goes to the top. And at the next box, so this is going to cancel. Sorry, I almost went over there and canceled it. On the next box, I'm going to put in, so joules cancel, and I end up with kilojoules. So I'll put kilojoules at the top, and I'll put joules at the bottom, and I know there's a thousand like this. And then I pull out my handy-dandy calculator with one I don't really like. 4.18 oh, sorry. 512 times 4.184 divided by 1,000. 2.14. It says 14222, two, 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 but anyways, I'm going to choose 2.14 because, oh, I forgot to put the 1 here. Because sig figs wise, there's three sig figs in this part of the answer. This is, uh, I think by definition, it's at least four, though. This is a definition. So you end up with three sig figs, 2.14 kilojoules. But even if it wasn't, the, the 
three is still the yeah, even though these are things I sometimes forget to think about. All right. <sighs> yeah, I just got a lot of stuff I still want to say. Where should I stop? I go till 2.30, right? Yeah, so I got 10 minutes. What am I going to say in 10 minutes that's important? Okay, let's do this. Make a slide. I'm going to define two terms for you, okay? We're going to do by experience, actually. Exothermic. Okay. What does exo mean? Outside. Like exterior. Exo yeah, exoskeleton crabs. You know those guys? I love them. They're very cool. So what exothermic means is heat energy goes out. When I burn paper, right, and like I said, I lit the paper here, right, and they all felt it get hot. Well, it got hot because energy left the paper and then went to them. So that is an exothermic process. So an exothermic process releases energy. And because it releases energy, the surroundings go up in temperature. Yeah, so releases energy to the surroundings. So the temperature of the surroundings goes up. So if I put an ice cube in your hand, right, what would happen in your hand? Melt. It would melt and your hand would get cold. So is that exothermic? No. no. Because when the ice cube is melting, your hand's getting cold, so it's the opposite of exothermic. Now if I took a piece of metal out of the stove, I'm stuck it on your hand, assuming the stove was on at a reasonable temperature and I just didn't uh, hurt her. But what would happen to your hand? It would get burned, right? That is an exothermic process. So, so when you're boiling water and you open the lid and the steam hits you on the arm, right, you get that burn, that's because you're being hit by an exothermic process. Endothermic is the opposite. Endo is like endoskeleton inside. Energy goes in. It absorbs energy from the surroundings. So when the ice draws the heat. It absorbs the heat energy from your hand. Yeah. So I'll be cold. So then you would be cold, yeah. Right. Endothermic, all, like it's always cold? It feels cold, yeah. Endothermic always absorbs energy, so always feels cold. Okay. okay. Oh, you're an athlete, let's say. Ten. You make them out. Oh, twist your ankle. Coach comes out. What's he put on your leg? Ice. Cold pack, right? He gets that compress and he goes snap and he sticks it on your leg and it gets cold, right? Is that exothermic or endothermic? Endothermic, endothermic because you felt it get cold. So whatever's going on in that little compress, it's sucking heat energy in from the outside. Okay? You can actually make those things so cold that it would actually freeze your skin. Now you, you don't, they don't do that. <laughs> Obviously, that has 
that's bad for the person, but you can actually make it so endothermic that it'll do that. Is that why they don't stay cold? Because they're really, they're getting all that energy yeah. or warming up? Yeah, they're re well, so there's a chemical process going on. They're absorbing energy, and then the chemicals run out. It takes that energy to make that process. Really yeah, and so you're actually making a chemical process go on inside that little bag. It's absorbing the energy, absorbing energy. Eventually, you run out of chemicals. It's like a battery. Like when you run a battery, eventually it starts out good. Over time, it gets less and less and less and less. Well, you're using up the chemicals inside the battery that are generating the electricity. They're reorienting themselves. Yeah. Yeah, so, so no, making new compounds. Okay. Oftentimes making new compounds. Now, lithium-ion batteries don't do that, but the old... A lot of the older batteries are making new compounds as the process goes. Lead acid battery, like car batteries, that's definitely a chemical process. And then what do you do with the lead acid battery all the time? You have an alternator in your car, and you're constantly generating electricity to reform the compounds in the battery so you can start your car later. All right. Now, um, let's see. So I did this, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this in another context. Physical and chemical energy, and uh, physical energies uh, are conserved. I did this really fun thing with my son the other day. We needed to make a flat lead weight. So I don't, you know, I, don't, I let my kids play with things like lead, you know, bad, bad parent, soldering irons, blow torches. That's okay because they're like older than eight now, so it's probably okay. We took a, lead, took a lead weight and a hammer, and you guys could do this, a lead fishing weight, and I needed to flatten it out because we were putting in a Pinewood Derby car, and it needed to be flat, so it made the car look cool. So I took a hammer, and I started hitting the lead weight with a hammer, and I wasn't thinking about it. I was holding it with pliers because I don't want to smash my fingers because I'm not that good with a hammer. I did it on top of a dumbbell that we use for weightlifting. I could have just used a dumbbell. When I finished and I touched the lead weight, how do you think it felt? It was so hot, I got burned. The reason is I was taking kinetic energy, hitting the, the lead weight, and putting that kinetic energy into the lead weight. That converted it to heat. So thermal energy, right, was conserved with kinetic energy. The amount of energy I spent hitting the lead weight became, become, became heat in the lead weight. Okay. You could also do this experiment... I wouldn't do this because you might hit somebody. Take a 10 kilogram weight, <laughs> throw it off a building and hits the ground and when you pick it up, the bottom of it will be hot because it converted all that potential energy into thermal energy at the bottom, okay? Heat energy. And this is what they talk about when they talk about the big meteorites stuff hitting. Hitting the earth? Exploding. Yeah. Vaporizing. Vaporizing everything. Okay. Um, just one other thing. On the concept of exothermic and endothermic, right? if this, in a chemical reaction, endothermic absorbs energy, the way we think of the chemical reaction is reactants start at low energy and then move to high energy. That's they absorb the energy from the surroundings. That's why everything around them becomes cold. So when you take ice and it melts into water, Right? That's why it feels cold. That's an endothermic process. On the other hand, if you start high in energy and then you go to low in energy, right, this energy has to be released and it's an exothermic process. So endothermic process, reactants are lower than products or whatever you produce. And an exothermic process, the reactants are higher than the product. You were talking about the, the, like the ice to, to when it melts. Uh -huh. So it's becoming from ice to liquid. Right. Which is, the liquid is a higher energy state, state yeah. than the heat, than the ice is. Yeah. And so that's the, it, that's the energy that it absorbed in order to accomplish that. Is yeah. That true? Yeah. It's good, huh? Yeah. It kind of all fits together. It's really good. I, I, I'm Okay, so I'm going to skip this. Okay, so I will tell you what problems not to do. There's just a few at the end that we won't be doing today, but I'll tell you which ones not to do in the homework. I'll just post it on Blackboard again. We'll save that for the next assignment. Good? All right. What's that?